closer we got to uh, Texas and the border, the more militarized <coughs> the land became. There were helicopters flying overhead. There were uh, <coughs> state police and border patrol cars all along the highway. It felt very strange. We got to Houston and I was the lead car, was driving the lead car, turned the corner to where we were gonna meet our group. And there was the largest group of people that we had met yet in, in our caravan. It was about 250 and they were all chanting, go grannies, go. And it was totally <laughs> awesome. And we pulled in and um, we had a demonstration and people talked and there was all of that. And then we were invited to lead the way to march to the detention center that um, was trying to be opened by ICE. But Houston, the politicians in Houston, the people in Houston were fighting it tooth and nail. One of the reasons that they were fighting it was that it had been an old shelter, homeless shelter, it had, had to be closed down because of mold. Nothing had been done to renovate it, but they were gonna put kids in this building that was too moldy for homeless people. Um, so, um, we had a, a very wonderful demonstration in front of the uh, detention center and um, some amazing police officers who, they were just right there with us. They, they, they were proud and pleased that we were there. It was great. Um, and after Houston, we made our way to McAllen, Texas. Now, if you know anything about Texas, it's big. <laughs> drive and 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 drive some more and you barely have made it like a quarter of the way across Texas. Anyway, we drove and drove and drove, but a group of our uh, people decided to take a side trip to the uh, Dilly Detention Center where a child had died um, after being detained there. And um, it's located in a very isolated area. Most of the facilities where, well, let's, let's actually, let's call it yeah. what it is. Most of the concentration camps where the children and the immigrants are being detained so are located in isolated areas, far from any that. services, be it mental health services, legal aid, this type of thing. Um, and then there's a reason for that. They want to keep it hidden. Okay. There's no signs indicating that this is the Dilly Detention yeah. Center. As a matter of fact, the group got lost and had to drive around a couple of times until they could find uh, this detention center. And then they drove in and unfortunately didn't get very far because they were immediately met by uh, two burly guards and a, a female supervisor, also burly, who made it extremely clear that without permission from ICE, we could not be on that property even though it was our government's property and we have to be citizens of the United States. And then if we did not leave immediately, we would all be arrested. And since that was not our point in going, but our point was to get to McAllen and work with the angry Tia's and Abuelas and the respite center in McAllen, we did leave and seated ground at that point. In McAllen, um, we were met with another rally and it kicked off 24 hours of action and learning. Um, these two men uh, here are founder of a group in Brownsville, Texas called Team Brownsville. And if you are on Facebook, you should definitely look up, uh, look that up and um, follow them. They take food across the Matamoros Bridge to migrants waiting to cross into the United States. They do it every single day. Uh, they take food and water. Um, so uh, they, um, they were awesome to talk to and they had a really great sign. If you, in case you can't really see that, those are onesies, little children, little babies onesies, and it says reunite on written out on the baby's onesies. We had a, you know, a wonderful receiving when we got to McGowan. And we were really surprised because we were on the road and we didn't really know what was going on. So when we got there, we found out that people had come all the way from Alaska in a motorhome in Portland, Oregon, to be down there, to speak out against family separation and the treatment of migrants at the border. 
And we were simply moved to tears by that. And since then, I have to tell you that I've been continuously surprised and grateful to find that most Americans really do support what we do. And they're generous in, to, in their response to those seeking asylum. Apparently it's only our elected officials from one party that aren't on board. When we were down there, we met many good people, local people who'd opened their homes up, their pocketbooks, bent over backwards, they're worn out, but time and time again, they get up every morning and they do absolutely what they can to help. Earlier on this day, we had been to what is known as a backpack stuffing party. <laughs> this was hosted, it was an event that was hosted by the Angry Tias and Abuelas, who uh, just won an award yesterday from the Robert RFK Humanitarian. RFK Humanitarian Award. They were a group like us, very moved in June by what was happening at the border. They uh, started this program of filling backpacks full of food, uh, meeting people at the bus stations in McAllen, Texas, and walking across the bridge to feed them. So we were at this event, we filled our backpacks, and we walked across the border from the U.S. side to the Mexican side. This was a sobering reminder to us that people are living outside in unlivable conditions as they await entry to the U.S. side. They often wait there for weeks and even months in what is pretty unbelievably unlivable conditions. If they're lucky, they live in makeshift tarps that's supplied to them by the Mexican Red Cross and volunteers who come over with stuff. Groups like the Team Brownsville and the Angry Tias who come over every single day. And meanwhile, on the U.S. side, sets an empty building, a brand spanking new looking empty building that's air conditioned with neat little waiting rooms, nice seats, nice and clean. The only person, <laughs> toilets, running water. The only person sitting in that building is a guard. None of this was going on prior to zero tolerance. None of it. They would let people in. They would check them in. They would give them a court date. They would let them go. All right. So <clears throat> when they do let uh, the asylum seekers cross the border, they're put in detention in these um, ice boxes that you may have heard about, uh, where it's kept at 57 degrees. They're all they're given is a mylar blanket. They just have to sleep on the concrete floor. They may be in this condition for anywhere from three to seven days. Some people are kept even longer than that. Uh, the purpose of this is to break their spirit and get them to give up and go back. While they're waiting for what's called a um, credible, fear. credible fear interview with the judge, when they have their credible fear interview, if they pass their credible fear interview, and not all of them do, but those who pass their credible fear interview are then um, taken by ICE by bus and dropped off at Greyhound bus stations. And this is happening across our southern border. In McAllen, Texas, they, had a, they have a humanitarian respite center that meets those ICE bus, ICE vans and buses, um, helps winnow out who's leaving immediately and who has time. Those who are leaving immediately are, are the unfortunate ones in some way because there's no time for them to get a shower, change of clothes, or anything beyond couple of sandwiches and a bottle of water. Those who have time are taken to the respite center that's run by Catholic Charities, and there they can get a shower, they can get looked at by the nurse, any medical conditions can be looked at, they get a change of clothes, uh, they get shoelaces for their shoes, belts, etc. cetera, uh, and then they get a hot meal, and the next day they're taken back to the bus to get on their bus. By the way, on the call, we have um, Catherine, um, <laughs> she's smiling at me. Uh, she is with uh, San Diego Rapid Response, and they are some of the people who are helping people before they get on the bus. Right. 
right? So th this was what we saw in McCown. Yes. We know that, it, that at various other places, El Paso as a community has stepped up unbelievably. Any number of communities on our southern border have dealt with this and have developed usually nonprofit and not local government, but sometimes local government have stepped forward to help out. Um, sometimes it's just little grassroots people who aren't even, you know, super nonprofits yet. Uh, so um, the, uh, unfortunately what's happening though, even in McAllen right now, is that they're overwhelmed by the numbers that are being dropped off. And so people are not even able to shower or get a change of clothes and are getting right on the bus in the clothes they've worn for a month or more. Um, so, uh, go ahead to the next slide. I was gonna just, um, this is what we, what met us in the bus station in Louisville. A guy arrived without any shoelaces. I mean, they slipped through several bus stations. So we always have shoelaces in our stash. And the shoelaces and belts are taken. Everything they own is taken. There's shoelaces, belts, wallet, papers, cell phone, everything is taken and it's not returned. Nothing is returned. So what they have is what they have, their paperwork. And that's a nice bus that's just, just dropped them off at what is a bus station terminal in the background there. Yeah. Um, and this is actually coming from El Paso. Right. It was a Getty in image. And uh, this was around Christmas. Right, it was Christmas Eve. Um, ICE did a huge dump on Christmas Eve when the normal groups that would normally help would be involved with other things. ICE did an incredibly huge dump you in El Paso. It, saw it on the news. And it was, it was hard Merry because Christmas. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families were just dumped out at that point. Normally, until things got really nasty, ICE was working with the respite centers, et cetera, and would let people know, now they don't. They just dump them. And what they do is they kind of hold them, and then they'll dump 500. And then there won't be anybody that comes through for the next seven days, and then they'll dump another 500, where they could space them out. We don't really know not to. <laughs> they choose not to. Um, so this was, this was what we were seeing as we were in McAllen. We were actually experiencing it. We were able to go to the bus station, see the ICE buses come in, drop the people off, watch, and we were able to go to the respite center, help out, um, and, and, and do all that. So that was part of our, our, our thing. We thought we would offer you the opportunity for a break here, or not. No? Okay. Want us to move forward? I'm going to take a chair because standing for long hours kills my back. We've got ready. So if you need a break, stand up, move around. We could ask her a question or two if you want to answer. Ask one now. Yes, ma'am. I understand about the taking of all those items and not returning them. Um, how do work does a psychiatric nurse often would take shoelaces and belts mm -hmm. because of potential for self-harm? I don't get the sense that that would be a concern. They, 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 claim, they claim that it's, it's because that they're gang members that, are, that are infl have infiltrated the families and they need to do that for the safety of the Border Patrol agents so that they don't get um, garroted. Also, I have an asylee who is living with me and she said that there are people in there who have been there for months who are horribly depressed. Oh, I understand. Yes. We have a, a note from San Diego that says that ICE and CBP also did a several hundred person dump there yeah. the before 2018 midterms in an attempt to get press coverage for the invasion. Yes, that's and true. San Diego agencies work together to retrieve the forward folk. Yeah. So, did you go to what we do? I will. After the break. Okay. Um, oh, also, if people ask questions here in the room, if y'all could repeat those because the microphone only picks up from you two guys. All right. Okay. All right. So we were down experiencing all of this in McAllen, and we were wondering, what can we do? And I don't know about you, but I actually have never taken a cross-country bus. I don't 
didn't used to know how the bus system worked. I now have far more intimacy with the bus system than I really want. <laughs> my slogan for my 60th year of life is see you at the bus station, but we'll get to all that. But we were trying to figure out what we could do because the McAllen and the people at the border can give a little bit of food to these families. But they're getting on buses and their trips are five and seven days long. And we thought, four sandwiches? How, how is that going? To, how are you going to make it for five to seven days? These families have no money. They have no language skills. They don't know how the bus system works either. So I did a little bit of research, figured things out. And the idea for the Overground Railroad was born right there in McAllen, Texas, in the conference room. And at the final meeting, I presented my idea to the assembled grannies. And I said, this is what we need to do. If you'll all remember the Underground Railroad, which helped transport uh, slaves running from uh, uh, slavery underground up to the north, this is going to be an Overground Railroad because the people are legal okay so it's overground and overground bus trip didn't work so we went to railroad overground railroad but there's going to be way stations just like there was for the underground railroad across the country where people can get help on their trip north to their sponsoring families we had a question come in from Ina um, she says we in Columbus are starting to organize and we are having a hard time setting boundaries can you offer some guidance on how to set boundaries? Um, or is it okay to go rogue? As an example, I have no issue taking people home for the night. Is this okay? I we, want to feel okay doing this. We're gonna talk we're about We're gonna cover that. all that in a little bit. Um, that's what, when we talk about Security. how we set it all up. <laughs> yeah, um, I think that's kind of where the right. organization We're going is. Right. 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 is where kind of we're focused. Yeah. All right, so we launched the, the Overground Railroad uh, the last weekend of August, two weeks after returning from McAllen, Texas, um, first we went to the bus station and scoped it out. We had been told of two buses to look for at the time that they would arrive in Louisville, that McAllen people knew that there would be asylees on because they're the ones who write out their paperwork for their, for their bus station stops. So <clears throat> we went down, we scoped it out, we sat around, we watched what was happening, we got a sense of what was going on, we went and spent a lot of money in the vending machines buying food for people. <laughs> um, and um, then we talked with the bus station manager. And we explained who we were, and we explained what we wanted to do, and asked permission to be in the bus station. And he was, um, amenable but a little bit unsure what we were planning on doing and so he asked us to follow a couple of simple rules that we agreed to and one was that we would have no more than five volunteers at a time meeting buses that we would not give food to the homeless and i'll cover that in detail in a minute and that we would not bring in food that we had made ourselves and again we'll cover some of the reasons for that he was perfectly fine with restaurant food or packaged food but uh, not food that we had made ourselves um, and we agreed to those rules and interestingly enough in the time that we've been working down there he has become a firm advocate of what we're doing and has even put in his office a bunch of snack kits and water and diapers so that if there are people at the station when we are not there, he can give those to them. Aww. So, yes. Now, when he texts me at 1 a.m. in the morning if there's somebody stuck overnight. And, and what, you, what you have to know, though, is not all the bus stations are as amenable. You have to go carefully when you're trying to set up. You have to find out what rules you're going to have to follow, where you're going to be able to stand, what you have to do. Because we have had grannies thrown out of Houston, Dallas, Atlanta, and Mobile 
um, because those bus station managers didn't want to deal with it. Now we've gotten sort of back into Atlanta and Mobile, and we're working on Houston. But it's, um, it is a fact that these are not public places. Well, let me back up. Some of the bus stations are municipal bus stations, in which case, go political. Find your politicians who are going to support you being in that bus station, okay? But if it's not a municipal bus station, if it is a bus station that's owned and operated by Greyhound, you are on private property and you have to be their guest. So just be aware of that. But the good news is we started with four. The three grannies who went on the caravan and an old local activist priest named Father Jim, who is 90 years old. And still a rock. And still go. Now we have 138 volunteers and are growing. So we, we started at the very beginning and have moved up. So go ahead, Sharon. All right, we're going to talk about what we provide currently. Okay, so time for show and tell. Time for show and tell. Yay. Okay, so <laughs> this is my wagon. We started with wheelie suitcases. That was untenable. We couldn't fit enough of our junk in there. And it was killer on the old ladies' rotator cuffs. So go ahead. Beth. So we have these collapsible wagons now that all of our leads get. And we um, gallon size bag filled with snacks and juice. We also provide fruit and string cheese. I didn't bring that. We provide baby supplies, hygiene supplies, first aid kit, over the counter meds, toys for kids, warm clothing. In the summertime, we still provide this is our baby kit. It's got wipes and diapers in it. And medicine? No, it's a fruit juice box. Uh, the, the medicine thing, we're Still working out. Uh -huh. We just kind of set it out on the table, over the counter stuff, and we let people decide. Themselves. Here's our medicine. This is the children's medicine. Um, we had a friend of ours um, translated the instructions into Spanish. Okay, very helpful if it's a Spanish speaker who is literate. Not terribly helpful if they speak one of the Mayan languages or don't read. But at least it's a step forward. So uh, we usually put this, uh, keep this kind of behind the counter. If a mother comes up and says, my child is sick, or if we notice that a child is sick, we will go over with her how to do it. We never administer the medication. We give it to the mother to do. Some of our partner coalition people do. <coughs> they dispense Robitussin. They do other things along the way. We, as a policy, do not yeah. dispense. So, we make it available. Sharon was talking about some of the other things. We always have shoelaces, because a lot of them come still. We have socks, both in the winter and summer, because the buses are cold. We will have all of this available by link, including the PowerPoint. We, we have do. belts, because a lot of them need belts to keep their pants up. Um, and then we have Children's toys. Grannies from New York knit those and send them to us. Oh. So if you have knitters, great. For people who can't come to the bus station, we'll talk about that later. There are all sorts of ways they can volunteer. Uh, the boys in particular love the little matchbox cars. And then the, for the <laughs> slightly older teens, we do journals with um, mechanical pencils. The reason we do mechanical pencils is because if the tip breaks, you can just push out a new one. Whereas if you give them a regular old pencil, the tip breaks soon. Um, we also do crayons and coloring books for the younger children. Um, <coughs> to show blankets. Not yet. I'm getting there. So we have blankets. Which we do offer all year round. Yes, because the buses are cold, very cold. Um, and then we have um, hygiene kits, which usually are a toothbrush, a toothpaste. So, yes? A uh, quick question uh, that was being asked is, 
why do they you know why they take the shoelaces and such? The question was why do they take the shoelaces and such? Supposedly for security. For security for the guards and for security for the other uh, prisoners and I guess suicide prevention. They have uh, severely criminalized this whole process. Um, they are now treating the asylum seekers as criminals. And thus, it would be similar to as if you went into a jail or. It's exactly. Yeah. <laughs> You, they it's would a take, protocol. They take Same your, protocol. Your, your belt, your shoelaces, that type of thing. So they're treating them as criminals. Okay. We are constantly changing the contents of our kits based upon the seasons, the budget, the number of travelers, and now the number of other teams meeting immigrants up and down the line now that we're hooked into to NIDA. I guess we should talk about, we talked about our tools, the collapsible wagon. Oh, yes. We did talk about the, the signage. Our grannies groups up and down. And they actually, people coming off the buses do notice and come up and hug us because they know it's us. Okay. I wish Nita would get sort of a button or something. We use buttons first and then we switch to this because they know people who read and speak Spanish know. Voluntario and, and the, the people in McAllen and Brownsville at least are telling the asylees to look for grannies and they show them and we have getting baseball caps for our grampies and other people who want to wear baseball caps. Um, and then Matt, Matt, here it is. Then we also all of our leads also get a map so that we're able to talk show them where they are where they started you need to and where race. they're going yeah we use a dry erase marker and where they're going where they have stops along the way yes um they really enjoy when we have time sometimes the buses are late we'll talk about that and sometimes the buses are late we don't have very much time but when we have time to sit and talk this is a wonderful conversation starter even without Spanish or other languages, you know, you can point, you can talk. A lot of them know, I'm going to New York. They have no idea where New York is. Or I'm going to New Jersey or whatever. And so we're able to show them. And then we, the other side, we can talk about, you know, where they came I'm from nervous, or, and, and whatnot. How far they walked. Yes. It um, blows their mind, our mind too. Question here? Yeah, I'm gonna turn on my mic to see if that helps. If it's too much, let us know. Um, so I think one thing I wanted to point out when you guys are showing like your buttons and your your signs here in Columbus, that's something that we're starting to talk about to figure out how we, we want to keep our low profile, but also be recognizable. And I think it is something for those that are listening and those that are um, involved here. So the Columbus Hub, as we are, we are not affiliated with Granny's Respond at the moment. So um, just to kind of help, I think that's where people are trying to figure out where each city lies. So I just wanted to put that out there right now. If that, I just wanted to kind of clarify that for, because I know as Dave organizes, right, and as we start to organize, right, even the more volunteering would be something they would recognize. Right, absolutely. So I just wanted to put that out there as I'm helping coordinate volunteers here in Columbus. I just wanted to, to let people know we didn't put this as an organizational meeting. So I just want people to know that we're organizing just as several groups of volunteers as a coalition. As great as possible, and, and we, are, we are more than more. Than, we we are more than interested in partnering with you. Oh, 100 percent, absolutely. And, and we we don't we don't have a thing that everybody has to be a granny and everybody has to do it our way. We're going to tell you how we do it and why we do it the way we do it, because we've learned some hard lessons along the way. Oh yeah. Hopefully you won't have to trip over those same things. You'll find new things to trip over. I assure you. Um, <laughs> we promise. We promise. But we want to share what we've done and then you all can use that information to help our cap because each and every city is different. It's different in the volunteers they're drawing from, it's different in their bus station, and it's different in how they're going to get supplies and how they're going to do the funding. Yes, Joe. Will you be speaking about how you're funded? We will. Thank you. We have a whole section on that. Um, 
This is what we're kind of currently offering. We keep changing that around too. Um, we're only distributing feminine hygiene supplies. We got a whole, we have an endless supply of toothbrushes and free toothpaste from the U of L Dental School. We have people who hook us up. That's part of the funding process. So, and we do a variety of supplies like chapstick and tissues and over the counter meds. We just set those on uh, the tables in the bus station and people who the asylees need it, they take it. Um, I no longer am packaging my baby supplies. Different leads do different things. We just have them out there. People take them, they need them. The, the collapsible wagons we use cost about 45 to 69 bucks and they weigh about 20 to 26 pounds and fold up to the size of a pretty large umbrella. The uh, maps are about eight bucks, Amazon. Let's talk about funding and supply management. How we fund and obtain our supplies, we have a GoFundMe, we have an Amazon wish list, we have donations in kind and cash from speaking events. We work the church circuits, the women's groups, anybody who wants to hear us, we go. Uh, when I went and did, uh, we went and met with the Presbyterian Women's Annual Spring Gathering and they gave us half of their offering and they collected items enough so that we could make 500 snap kits. Uh, soon, we're going to be able to engage in the really fun task of grants writing, as we now have a 501c3, and as a former administrator of a nonprofit, I will not do that ever that, that, again. We, um, the 501c3 status, is that like Granny's Respond, all of you have gotten together? Yes, that's that? Granny's Respond National, okay. and what, what will happen is that each state will become a chapter under Granny's Respond National, but at this moment in time, any donations to Granny's Respond are tax deductible. And we have a 501c3 through Unitarian Society that is covering four different cities and four different groups trying to organize here. Excellent. Yeehaw, you're yes. way ahead of game. Because yes. we have to do, you know, we each of uh, the Granny groups had to do their own little GoFundMe. And uh, we were begging for a lot of supplies. And honestly, Beth and I funded it for the first month ourselves. Uh, we manage our supplies this way. Each bus route uh, has what we call a supply manager, uh, or we fondly refer to Marsha as our supplies are. Uh, she uh, it's hard to kind of explain how she does it. She works with a group and gathers donated supplies for a month for all of the volunteers on a bus route. Somehow magically does it so that every volunteer for that route for a month has supplies. They come and pick up their supplies and then she, she drops them off and it happens all over again. What I I'm, I'm one of the leads, and so what I do is I let Marcia know how many buses I'm meeting or how many shifts I'm, I'm doing at the station. And I know that I need, um, we, we had been saying 40 snack kits for each shift, but we've dropped that down to 30 because you all are now going to be meeting people. We were, we were supplying people through to New York, but we don't have to do that anymore. So. Like I now do 30 snack kits for every bus, uh, every shift. And so I count up how many times I'm going during the month and I call Marsha and I say, okay, I'm going to need, you know, 80 snack kits or whatever. It might, well, it's probably a lot more than that, but uh, I'm going to need, you know, 100 snack kits. And she gets it all together for me. Uh, so this is Meg from Columbus. Um, just checking when you guys assign your teams, you're doing it by bus route. Correct. Okay. So our thing that we're um, kind of juggling with here in Columbus is that, as you all know, as you've become intimately aware with the bus system, um, it is anything but on time. And so um, one thing that we're dealing with is a lot. Most of our volunteers. One of the reasons we're not with 
respond is most of us are very young. We're not even moms yet and grannies. So a lot of us are very young and a lot of us have um, uh, full-time jobs. Yeah. So being able to assign a volunteer to a bus route is tricky because, because I might be able to go there up until 6 p.m. Yeah, but I might have to work. So if I'm you know, you know, working, working with a route, so, so our, our thought was to try to do time jumps. And, and but I'm sure you're and that's that's wonderful. And that's a wonderful way to do it. We did we did specific buses. We knew that we were going to be needing these specific buses. But what we've always told our volunteers is, if it's going to come so late that you can't meet that bus, that that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Did you guys just try bus routes from the beginning? Yeah. Is that your first? Yeah. We're going to try that as well. We just tried you, There are lots of, you get creative with this. But, uh, you have to, depending on, like she said, with your, what, however your makeup of your particular group of volunteers is going to be. We have talked about the idea of a rapid, actually, we have a, a, what we, it's not official, we have a rapid response team that goes down and we know somebody's going to, like we had a pregnant person that was coming through from Memphis who they thought was in labor. You know, yeah. we're going to have to go down that and meet that bus. We did. Yeah. And that's something that we've had with um, Ina, yeah. who I think is on here. Her team, is a, you know, law, immigration law yeah. office is very close, and they are able to get there quickly, and they go very and frequently. Is, there are lots of ways that this yep. works. You just have to figure it out. And, right. You know, and, and we're, we're changing all the time. Because if we went for a shift, we could possibly hit three buses um, right. with that shift. Um, the morning, there's only one bus that's coming in with the asylum seekers. So just meet that bus and, you know, but in the afternoon, there are three buses. Potentially, if, if they came on time, that would come within a three-hour <laughs> period of time. It would make sense to have volunteers come. And we go in the show. morning sometimes, and we have people that have been there. The morning meeting, the 915 bus, that's the one I meet. We'll find people there that have been there from 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. You know, so got to dance with it. Joan? Uh, in general, do you have at least two people go each time or three? Well, we're going to get to that. We, okay. We're going to get to the actual structure. We're, we're, we're kind of still on the funding piece right now. And then we'll get, when we get to the end, you can save all of your questions. Otherwise, we're old and we'll forget. Work with us. <laughs> okay. We, I think we were on how we, how we did the supply things. We don't have a central supply place to store this stuff. So we have to kind of um, work with how we do the supplies. The, the PM uh, bus route uh, meets at a church, and all their volunteers for that route brings their supplies. They package all their kits, and then they leave with the kits that they need for the week. When we first started out, I was doing all of it. My basement looked like a Dollar Tree, and people were sending me donated supplies via a, a, an Amazon gift list. We called these porch prizes. <laughs> every day I would get up and my husband would laugh because he works for UPS and every day he would say I feel sorry for the UPS driver who has to deliver these. We get really creative about the uh, fundraising. I don't know where that slide went. Where did we? Oh yeah we go. We have snack kit parties which is always fun. This family group and neighbors got together and they had everybody bring some stuff and they had fun. Uh, this one down here was a margarita and authentic Mexican food party in which we, everybody had a role to play. This was the Presbyterian women's donated goods in which we assembled in one hour 500 snack kits. Margaritas make it more fun. <laughs> Up here was a, was a church uh, youth group and uh, after church party in which people donated supplies and uh, we made the snack kits after that. It's a wonderful intergenerational church event. Um, our church absolutely loved it because everybody from the youngest to the oldest could do. It's a community-wide thing. Yes. Um, so we've had some churches, like bigger congregations, kind of express interest, and in, we're in the probably in the stages still of trying to figure out kind of coordinating with them and how best they can help out. If you had a church that was interested in doing something, would you probably 
go in person, like encourage them to organize an event, and then you would probably go in person and talk to them a bit. We have a model for you for that. Oh, okay. And we'll make that, and we have a list too, and then you can adapt that for however it works. Okay. We often have people walk up to us in the bus station and give us cash money. Uh, I have, t I meet total strangers on Facebook. I know this isn't safe. <laughs> do it at a bookstore like I do. They go to the local Costco or Sam's Club, buy a bunch of stuff, and I meet them, and they give me their stuff, and I put it in the back of the Honda. Now this is the fun part about how we are structured. Oh, yes. All right. So, you know, we started out just really, really grassroots. But after a while, you do have to have some structure. You have to figure out how you're going to get the volunteers in groups and send them all. And this is how we this do is it. how we do it. Y'all are going to do it differently, but just so you know, this is how we do it. So there, there are two buses we're meeting now. We're adding a third bus, and we're actually talking about expanding this time frame so we can meet two additional buses. Each of these buses has a team coordinator. And that coordinator is in charge of checking our volunteer schedule weekly to make sure there's going to be enough volunteers. And if there's not, sending out an email request is responsible for um, dealing with issues, crises. This is the person that if I'm at the bus station and I discover that somebody is very ill and needs to go to the hospital, I'm going to call Sharon. We'll actually with me, I just call me, but <laughs> let's presume it's not me. Uh, I call Sharon and and say, okay, we've got a crisis. We need to do X, Y, or Z. And then Sharon would give approval to spend money so that person can get reimbursed or whatever it might be. Um, so that's the team coordinator is really the, the person in charge. They're the ones you can turn to for all the issues. If we have to send somebody on an Uber, because their sponsor didn't come to the bus station to pick them up and the bus station is going to be closing and it's freezing cold outside and they have small children. We put them on an Uber and then, but Sharon needs to know about it and then it gets reimbursed. Um, so then after the team coordinator, there's a supply coordinator for each bus. Ours is Marsha, the supply czar. Yes, salute Marsha. Um, and then there are team leads. And the team leads are the ones with the wagons and the supplies. The team lead is responsible for their team of volunteers at the bus station. Okay. The volunteers often bring other things with them when they come. We ask the volunteers to be responsible for bringing water and fruit and other things. Um, around Christmas, a lot of the volunteers brought um, little candy canes and things like that. Okay. So the volunteers come, but they're not responsible for bringing the food, the, the actual bulk of this, this stuff. That's the team lead. Um, the volunteers and the leads sign up on our sign up genius. Are we at the, are we there yet? No, I, I already did all this stuff. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So. The, the lead's responsible for picking up the supplies, as I said, oh, and tracking the bus. Have you all had fun with that yet? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Fun okay, time. fun times with the Greyhound bus tracker. It lies. It lies. It's often on crack. Um, y'all, hopefully you'll... the bus just flew, because... <laughs> Yeah, definitely <laughs> two hours further. Right. Hopefully, <laughs> even the GPS part. Hopefully, you all realize that there's two parts to the GP, to the bus tracker. There's the schedule, and if you scroll down lower, there's the GPS. I put much more faith in the GPS than I do in the schedule. Okay, um, because we have had the schedule saying that it will arrive in 15 minutes, and the GPS still has it down in Nashville, which is three hours south of me. I'm not thinking that it's going to arrive on schedule, all right? But as the lead, I'm responsible for getting up on Saturday morning, because I'm the Saturday morning lead, and checking my bus tracker and discovering how late my bus is going to be. 
note, I did not say whether or not it was going to be on time. That is a myth. If you have an on-time bus, please contact me because I don't think they exist. <laughs> um, we consider the morning bus to be on time if it arrives an hour later than it's scheduled to. So yes, that's an on-time bus. Um, but I'm responsible for tracking the bus, for checking the tracker, figuring out what's going on. And then if the bus is going to be later than an hour, I will contact my volunteers that have signed up for that day and let them know, okay, so it's not coming in until 1130. Are you still good with coming down? You know, yes or no, I may have to recruit family members to come help me if need be, but we get it done. I also am responsible at the team lead to report numbers to my team coordinator because this is very important. In order to track numbers is how we're budgeting for supplies, etc. We need to know daily how many people are coming, and then we need to know weekly, etc. But we also report numbers out to the NIDA um, group. And when doing that, that means that you all, if you're part of that NIDA Facebook thread or your leads are, you would know how many people are coming. Now, yeah, again, that's in theory. Okay, I might hear from Memphis that 15 people are coming for the Saturday morning bus. And when they get off the bus, there are 23 people. What happened? Well, it could be that not everybody got counted in Memphis. It could be people were added in Nashville. Okay. Sometimes things are really crazy in Louisville. If it's a late bus, we have like 10 minutes to interact with those people and figure out who's going where and write it down and send it up to Cincinnati. I may overcount or undercount. Sometimes we have no minutes. Yes, sometimes they won't even let them off the bus mm -hmm. because they don't generally change buses in Louisville. So, um, so sometimes we don't know and sometimes the information we have is not completely accurate. Again, assume that it's a guesstimate. It's a bit like the time the bus is coming. Um, we try hard. And I know that Memphis tries hard to let us know, and you all are going to try hard to, you know, let people up further on up know. But it's not an exact science, and you'll drive yourself crazy trying to make it one. Okay. A little bit of this has just got to flow with what's happening. Um, as again, I said, the, the, the team lead is responsible for problem solving. You're going to have times where people need their need to be reticketed. Um, where right people who you think might be in labor? Yeah, pregnant people you think yeah. might be in labor? We're, we're, we're there, we're standing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you might, you know, you, you might have somebody who needs medical care. The kid with really bad diarrhea. Yes. Uh, so so the, the lead is responsible for problem solving and then can bump things up to the team coordinator if they don't, if they need help. We use our signs and badges to identify who we are. Other grannies in other cities do the same. Whatever you come up with, however you decide. What We are lucky in Louisville that we have the bus station manager's 100% support, and he has told the bus drivers to let us get on the bus. Wow. So we take our sign, wherever is it? We take our sign, and we get up on the bus, because sometimes they're reluctant to get off. They don't want to get involved with things they don't understand or know. So we get up on the bus and we have a little spiel. We say, you know, bienvenidos, um, welcome to Louisville, hoy soy tu abuela. That's my spiel. Uh, today I'm your grandmother. And then we Tengo tell them, dias gratis. Yes. We tell them we have free food and to come and, and, and get some. Um, some, of, some of the people coming are very familiar with the granny's emblem and they recognize it. I had one, one woman get off the bus, and you can, you can usually tell our people because they don't have any luggage. They don't have a phone, because everybody else getting off the bus, the first thing they're doing is doing this, but our people don't have a phone, um, and they, they're looking around confused. They're lost, and they don't know where they're going. Um, so it's pretty easy. 
A couple of times I've approached someone who was not an asylum seeker, but you know what? I've never had anybody snap at me for trying to help them, so it's okay. Um, but, uh, but we've had people get off the bus who immediately recognized our granny logo and just, you know, big hugs and their face lit up and they were like, oh my gosh, I'm safe for a few minutes. We also tell them to look for other helping people. We don't know who they are, but to look for helping people with smiling faces in the other bus stations. Right. That will help them there. There's always a lot of confusion about the scheduling. Mm -hmm. And that is the biggest issue. That's why I hope however we coordinate this as a coalition, we figure out a way to identify one another to each other, to them. Yeah, so some for, universal smiley face, purple emblem, or something. So for example, if we know what Cincinnati or Columbus uh, badges are gonna look like, we can tell people Okay, hey, when you go to Cincinnati, look for this kind of badge. Or when you get to Columbus, because you have to change buses in Columbus, you need to look for these people to help you. So that's when we first started out, we had to send our photo and our ID down to McAllen when they were sending the people from the humanitarian center so that they could show the people when they were sending them to look for us. And for us in Columbus, that's one thing that we're talking about is it, within this next week or so, a very high priority point for us is going to, for us to determine what either our sign looks like, what our button's gonna look like, what our, whatever our identifier is going to look like. Yes, to us. And once we know that, we'll, we'll spread that out. Um, and we'll, then you guys can have a picture of that to show. I think what we're really juggling right now is trying to figure out what is visible but is not overly visible, yeah. and, and, um, and that's, that's so why we started out. <laughs> right. So that's what we're to just. So that would be awesome if we could send that on to you guys, yeah. and then we could right. know where they're going to after that. We could also be united, like within all of Ohio or something, too, with other groups who are upward, like all like the little Ohio states. Yeah, like look for this in Ohio, so they don't have to remember. Like, yeah. Okay, if we don't see someone in Columbus. I mean, can you? I, you know, I have been a mission worker in Guatemala and I walked around in a state of stupor the whole time I was there. I didn't know where, what state I was in, what oh, department yeah. I was in. <laughs> it's just, I was with a guy and people who spoke the language. Um, I have a question for you, like a word with me. Yes, hi, Meg. Meg, I am. I am. We have definitely talked. Yes. <laughs> um, I have a question about the need for both to because that seems to be a theme I kept hearing, and I'm not clear why we need to have roads. So that's the little maggots show up, and then you'll understand why it's kept low. We have some the maggots with the signs name. Oh, have you been saying maggots? USA or we have not. Yeah. <laughs> so we're having we're having some colorful remarks in the back and to describe some of the protesters that could show up. Um, I think that. I think the main reason where low visibility came in from Columbus was from the original webinar that we had all heard where we were hearing of instances and things that were happening in Phoenix and other places. Um, and while we are definitely not in the hotbed of that, I think, um, right, right, right. And so there, the, I think as we, as we were looking as a way to, uh, I, think, I think it's best to be established first, loud second. So while we were figuring out who we are and what we were doing and all of that stuff, I think that was kind of our initial thing. And then just making, but yeah, I mean, the low visibility thing can come and go and can be adjusted as needed. But we've, that was we've discovered, we've discovered that um, we, we maintain relatively low visibility. We try not to be a distraction in the bus station. Um, we, we keep to the five volunteers at a time. We wear our badges so that the bus station people know who we are, as well as the asylum seekers, okay? Um, and they don't kick us out when they're closing the station or when they're kicking all the homeless people out. They come around, they want to see your tickets, and I go like this, and they go, okay, and, and move on to the next person. Um, so, so it can be valuable to be identified. We've had one negative, politically negative person in the, 10 months that we've been in the station and innumerable, innumerable positives. We have a lot of Amish who pass through our uh, bus station and they generally don't have um, English coin to give, 
but will give us bananas or things that they have that, that they've seen that we're giving out and they want to share. We have had great conversations with people from all walks of life, uh, wanting to know who we are and what we do, and people who literally have given me the last two dollars that they have because they think we need it more than they do. Um, Somebody brought a whole uh, case of water in from their car. Yeah, they said, oh, I've got water in my car. Do you need it? And I'm like, yeah, they just bought it to us. They were picking somebody up at the bus station and they just gave us their water. Um, so I, I do think- You did have to make a policy as a group yes. about the political guy. Yeah. Because the police got called. Because our volunteer put his hand up and she started screaming, it was a woman. Who screamed, you touched me. And, and that's the thing with the low visibility at this point. Yeah. Since you're not, and, and Ina and some and other people we, have brought this up, since we're not organized enough, we don't right. have, we can't, we don't know what to tell our volunteers that if this happens, then do this. Well, since we'll we're not even home. there yet, yeah. 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 at this point, it's just, you know, right. show up, do what you can do. We had to make it up. Your thing. And, and the policy was get our asylees safe and back on the bus as quickly as possible go to the manager, our manager knows what the policy is, and tell them you're being harassed, and, and then, then vacate they, the bus station. Right. Don't engage with them because you will not win that argument. And that's, we just haven't, like, we that's, know any, <laughs> that's why the police got involved. Right, that's because we just haven't communicated that to our so, Just one where we can give some advice, and it's on page. And, and, and I, I made a really short statement, I just made a really short statement about giving food to the homeless, okay? Now, I have to preface that with my nine to five job, well, actually it's more like a 16 hour a day job, but is I am the director of social services for the Salvation Army Louisville Area Command, okay? All right, that's what I do other days of the week, all right? Um, I know something about homeless services in Louisville, just, just you know, you know, a very small smidgen, I'm sure. There is, there are feeding sites available to homeless people all over the city of Louisville. Okay. The homeless are not going hungry in the city of Louisville. And I can, I'm speaking about my city. I don't know about other cities in the city of Louisville. However, if you become known as a place where homeless people can come get free food, Oh, at 9.15, there's these ladies at the bus station that will give you free food. What's going to happen at the bus station? There's going to be a lot of homeless people, and the bus station doesn't want them there. Okay? So as good guests of the bus station, we do not provide food to the homeless. And I have no problem saying no to that, because I know they are not starving. Yes, ma'am? We have plenty of food downtown for homeless people, we also have a street sheet, and we might want to have street sheets for our volunteers, so they can hand them out and say, "Where's the idea?" Yes, like we can't give you this, but here. Right. Exactly. That's a that's an excellent resource. Yes, ma'am. What is some good language to go to the station manager and say, "Here's what we're doing." So we have your permission to do that. Okay. So Ina has contacted. So we do have one. I'm oh, sorry. So Ina has contacted um, someone at the bus station named Rachel, and they have phone numbers, and she's been very helpful. Okay. So we do, so that would be like, still would be very helpful for the rest of us that may interact with them, but just so Columbus knows, we do have a contact at the Greyhound. Agents that we've interacted with, reticketing have been. The best way is to know somebody who knows somebody. somebody. But, yeah. yes, that's a great question, just so people know. It's, we do have know somebody who knows somebody who works for Greyhound? That's the best avenue. And then you might point them in the direction to other Greyhound operations that are running well. Our people at NOLO, New Orleans, were the first people that got theirs up and running, and they were our teachers. You yeah, yeah. remember how I said Texas was a really big state? They well, got back before. They got to New Orleans before we had left Texas on our way home on the caravan, so they got started before. <laughs> and they had their whole like thing up and running. But they also said, go set in the bus station a, a week before you were up and running. They were there two days because they felt so bad about seeing the asylees hit the station without anything that they went and bought snacks and were handing them out. So they didn't wait either, just so you know. 
And different bus stations are going to have different uh, rules and regulations. They're going to have different opportunities. NOLA just is in total envy of the fact that we have tables in the local bus station. So we're able they're to- They're small. They're small, but we're it's able probably to- not any, the station is- Yeah, probably about to lose this room. <laughs> That's not very big. Do you bring the tables or the tables? No, the tables are there. And, and we, but we set up at a table. I bring my uh, handy dandy wipes, wipes to wipe the table down with. And then uh, we set up and I have bowls for the fruit and bowls for the, the cheese sticks. And, and we have it set up so that it looks welcoming. We put the toys out and the socks and the shoelaces and the medicines. And so people can come and they can take what they need from the table. We usually have bags prepared. We got bags donated. This is a really, really, really good thing. Get bags donated. We go through, how many did we a say? A lot. We go through a lot of 8,000 bags probably in a year. Um, get bags donated from wherever you can get them. We have a lot of, a lot of asylees running around with Caesars Casino no bags. bags. Yes. <laughs> okay. Doesn't matter. Um, when they folded in Indiana. We got a bunch. We, for them. You know, we pre-stuffed the bags for a family of two. So it's two snack kits, two water bottles, two hygiene kits. And then what's on the table, they can decide what that they want. Yes, ma'am. Um, so a logistical question. You were saying that you're the team lead for that day. For that bus. The for that bus. day for that bus. So you're saying for each bus you need, there's a lead for like Monday mm -hmm. X bus, Monday Y bus, yeah. Monday Z bus. Yeah. Okay. So we have 138 volunteers. Right so now. here's our here's our here's our helpful tips tips list. Beth, go over okay. there. All right. So she's going to explain what your sure, question. We need to ensure that there is a team of volunteers for each day of the week for each bus route, and one person is designated as the. We use what we call sign up. What what's we sign up genius, and once you come, we have training. The first Saturday of each month at eight thirty at the bus station is an open training. Volunteers must come to training. This this is the way we work it. Okay. Not the way you have to work it. Tell you what we do. Volunteers must come to training. Volunteers must sign the volunteer agreement. And then they are given the link to the Sign Up Genius as well as all sorts of other documents that they might want. And they get to start signing up and coming um, to the bus station. Um, we do that because it helps um, you would think that adults would know things like not to drive asylees from the bus station to a Mexican restaurant. They don't know those things. Yes. Or you wouldn't think they would, you would think that they would know not to drive a pregnant asylee who had missed her bus and her child to another city two hours away. You don't, we don't do that. It's a liability to the bus station and it's a liability to the group. It's good hearted, but you just don't do that. And, and, and I think we may be overly cautious in global and that's, that's fine. But that's, that's how we do that's it. That's how we do it. But it, because A, we're protecting our volunteers because some not nice people do come through the bus station. Some nice people do cross over the border who are seeking asylum. It's a, we do want to have security for our volunteers as well as for our asylees. And you don't know who, not only you don't know who the asylee actually is, but you don't know who may be chasing the asylee in terms of gangs or coyotes who are owed money. And um, if they find out that you have some connection to the asylee, that could turn nasty. So so we, we're, we're open. Oh, we're, we're overly, overly, cautious overly cautious because we're grandmothers. So. Yeah, and and from San Diego, I've been meeting with the ACLU about human trafficking risks, and um, I'm gonna like hear you, but but hopefully just uh, I think hopefully probably just twenty snack kits per bus. Twenty per bus. Twenty per bus. Oh, on average, and. How do the team leaders get the supplies? Do they ever serve as the supply drive? Like the supply coordinator? Yes, the supply coordinator sometimes takes it to the supply lead, um, or the supply lead goes 
Uh, our, supply, our supply coordinator is generally fairly open to on her way to etch, she'll meet you here or that type of thing. Um, Central so location. I go I go to her house after after work once a month and pick up all my supplies and I just keep them at my house. Then I have a month's worth of supplies. Other people pick up a week at a time. It's just whatever is easy for, easier for you. Um, I tend to meet um, two buses a week. I do Saturday and Sunday mornings. So I need 10 buses worth of supplies. So The other bus route meets at the church once a week. All the volunteers that are going to work the bus station, they do it after church, after mass. They all bring supplies. They all pack the kits. And then they go home with the supplies that they're going to be servicing that bus route. With. So, so that's it, how it just do. depends on what works for you and um, how you want to do it is however is it's going to work for you. And what we've discovered is that there's a number of churches and groups who sort of want to on a regular basis, maybe once a quarter type of thing, provide us with snack kits by having a supply coordinator to tell those churches, okay, I'm going to need supplies in May or I'm going to need you know, I don't need to pull up in June. We're fine. We need to move them. Yeah, we're going to run. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So the other thing, though, is that some volunteers aren't going to be able to go to the bus station for a number, any number of reasons. And there should be opportunities for them to get involved as well. So they may do sex at packing. Maybe they are good at finding donated items or fundraising or being your digital media person. Utilize your volunteers as much as you can. Okay, keep them connected. Okay, go ahead. What we have learned, challenges, you're gonna have them. Lots of them, they're always gonna change. Your circumstances are gonna change and your challenges will change as immigration laws constantly change. It's like uh, uh, the uh, Border Patrol people just like to routinely dump people randomly, depending on what the politics of the day are or when elections are. Processes will evolve and improve over time and as are needed. We got into the training um, and we went over the uh, agreement. We want the rules to be clear so that it protects the volunteer, it protects you, and it protects the asylee travelers. And it provides a way, this is how we protect, how we collect the information for every single volunteer. We don't do background checks, but the bus station in some cities ha is asking that background checks are done on the volunteers that are in the bus station. So we are hoping that doesn't happen to us, but this is a way for us to keep at least some information in a database about our volunteers. I'm sorry, who's asking? Who's asking? Uh, Greyhound. They're not asking us. They haven't asked us yet, but down in El Paso, the word was that the sister Denise, who is the liaison with the Greyhound group down there, the group down there, uh, she's the liaison with Greyhound, was that in the future they were going to start asking uh, back for background checks. And that was really pissing, excuse me, uh, irritating a lot of people because some of the volunteers are DACA, and uh, that is not going to be a good thing if that happens. Okay, uh, that's actually mild. Uh, I've learned a lot of swear words in the last two years. How about the rest of you? It's safe to swear in this building. Okay, good. Uh, we, oh yeah, I know websites that teach really good Spanish swear words. All right, um, we establish policies as we discussed regarding personal safety and security for our asylees. Um, you all may find you have to do the same things. We follow Greyhound Incorporated policies, and that's regarding photography. They do not like pictures of their logo showing up anywhere. We have had quite a few videographers want to come and do documentaries and press people. We <laughs> said no way, Jose, because that is a violation of our asylees. We do not take pictures of their faces. We sometimes take pictures of the backs of their heads but only the two of us are allowed to do that. We do a lot of feet, uh, hands. hands. We do a lot of pictures of us. We do a lot of pictures of our food. We do a lot of pictures of our stuff. Uh, but, yeah, we, and and just, just a quick comment about that. One thing that's really important to understand is the power and authority dynamic, okay? Um, it's called white privilege. Okay. 
even if we don't feel as though we are in charge, the asylees are looking at us as though we are. And so they have been through an extremely traumatic couple of weeks before they come to you, probably a couple of years before that. They have been handled by, mishandled by guards with guns. And so when you say to them, can I take your picture? Even if they don't want you to, they will say yes. Please don't put them in that position. Don't pull the clergy card. We've had a little problem with that. And, little priests and nuns and things. And the other thing about touching. Um, we get lots of hugs. I always hug back. You may always reciprocate, but don't initiate. That's our, that's our mantra with our volunteers. Reciprocate, but don't initiate touching. And the kids are really cute and it's hard. And, <laughs> and it, it, it is, but the kids will come and give you hugs and then you can reciprocate, okay? But it, it is, um, it's really important to understand where these people have come from, their history of trauma, their recent trauma, and we need to be careful as white American citizens to not be putting our presumptions onto them and to not be forcing any, you know, I mean, we're seeing these people for half an hour. Maybe they don't want a hug from me. I'm just going to have to live with that, okay? <laughs> um, in most cases, we get lots of hugs, but we're always careful that we're not the ones initiating that. Okay. Back to Greyhound. Okay. That list. That's the ones we got from Greyhound Corporate that NOLO got, New Orleans got. So we try to observe that. And uh, what we use to save our own sanity is a sign up genius, a digital sign up thing. Volunteers are responsible for signing themselves up and signing themselves off. I go in once a week and check to see if there's enough people. If they don't have a lead, I delete the day. Adios. <laughs> No, what, nobody's there, and I try to let Nita know. Um, we do that to make sure that the routes are covered and so that I don't have to cat her. Um, and we use the digital media as much as possible, understanding that volunteers may not be digitally savvy and they're going to complain. So we try to hook up, especially when we're working with people in my age group, but not necessarily. I know some younger people who brag about it. And Sign Up Genius is an antique of, a, of a, a platform, but it's free. And it works for us. And it works. So um, we have people, we do have, some, these are Hanover students who came down for a day to work with us. Uh, so we try to partner volunteers with this consideration. Each person has different gifts and skills. And these are some of our Kentucky grannies. As you can see, grannies a loose term. <laughs> <laughs> they come in all shapes and sizes. Yeah, just uh, no, just that day. Okay, okay, <laughs> sure. And we do, um, granny sometimes bring their grandkids, but the rule is you don't bring a parcel. And we, li we limit it to five, and the sign up will only allow you to sign up five, and then it locks out. And uh, you have to be responsible for your own grandkid. And this lovely couple, we and our grannies don't always come from the Louisville area, some of them drive an hour. And this couple actually, we deliver supplies to their house in uh, Lexington, Kentucky, which is about an hour outside of Louisville. And this woman has Alzheimer's. She doesn't remember a lot of things, but she does remember how to pack snack kits and she loves doing it. And her husband is a retired pastor and he drives up to Frankfurt, which is the midway point. And uh, our supply czar goes down and meets him and picks him up. This woman drives up from Frankfurt uh, during rush hour to uh, work a shift once in a while. And she scored us these wonderful bags from the Baptist church somehow. Our last little section we wanna talk about, and this is really, really, really important, is to be kind to yourself. And we mean that. Yeah, not every bus can be met. We were told by the Agri Tears and Abuelas in McAllen, Texas, and then again by Sister Denise. The migrants were here before we were in the bus stations, and they will be here long after we are gone. Anything we do 
anything at all, is more than they would have received otherwise. So even if you get to a point where you have no way to supply food or anything, still your presence at the bus station with a welcoming smile and your ability to perhaps help them through some of the chaos of the station and changing buses is golden. They wouldn't have it if you weren't there. But be kind to yourselves. If you treat each and every situation as an emergency that needs high alert, that everybody has to get going right away, et cetera, you will burn yourselves out faster than you will believe. We're in this for the long haul. We started last August. We're still going. We're picking up steam, as a matter of fact. The entire idea is picking up steam. We are spreading throughout the United States. Your organizations in Ohio, a new organization in Baton Rouge, we're getting some up the East Coast, okay? But if we are not kind to ourselves and are not kind to our volunteers, we will burn out. This is a hard, long journey, not just for the asylees. And it's not us. always easy work, I want you to know, but it's the most rewarding. Most of our volunteers come and they do not leave. Be prepared to sit in your car if you haven't already and cry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Be prepared to have your life changed forever. And this is a good thing. And be prepared to touch all you meet. And make sure that you tell everyone that you meet that seeking asylum in the United States of America is absolutely legal. And the other piece is our job is not to equip these people to live in the United States. Our job is to simply get them on their way to their sponsor. We only need to take care of them that far. So yes, I know that they may not have the best winter coat for New York, but while they're on the bus, they have a blanket and that is okay right? Um, you have to let yourself know that it's okay to not have everything for everyone. We've had little children and even adults come through that don't have shoes and we haven't been able to ha have shoes for them. Two pair of socks works well, okay? Call up the line. Yeah, send up, the, up line. the line. Maybe Give me shoes. shoes. But two pair of socks will do, especially on the bus. You're not doing much walking on the bus. Okay, just remember that we are not preparing these people for life of their lives beyond the bus. We are prepared, we are helping them get from point A to point B with food and water and what they need. Yes, ma'am. Sizing is always a problem. I mean, all, all of the leads carry a, a, a few pairs of shoes in our cars. We've done it. And once in a while, bingo, we hit the right size. And, and, you know, once in a while, we carry some hoodies rolled up. Hoodies seem to work because you can get make three sizes, you know. Yes. But the blankets, because having served in Guatemala, you know, they put a blanket around their neck and they wrap up in a blanket, yeah. you know. And that, we, get, we get these. Uh, it's one size fits all. Flat size, please throw. Uh, well, we, 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 we scored a thousand. We, we, we hooked ourselves up through the um, Salvation Army. <laughs> we had extra blankets that they weren't using. And yeah, we're you guys network big. I mean, broad. Get free stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, Sharon went to another nonprofit in my town is getting the first aid kits. Yeah. Yeah, so. You never know. I mean, just ask around. I mean, the oddest people I've talked to end up scoring stuff for me. Can you run into, or I, I, I feel like this is something that is political, even though it perhaps should not be. So have you run into, like, say, a big business that you know makes thousands of drawstring bags that look great, talking to someone there and presenting it in a way that they're not like, ooh, we don't want our name associated with I always it. talk, I always try to sell it I was in marketing before I was selling Jesus. 
tigers. <laughs> um, I always sell it as a humanitarian note. Like the way that we can all think about it. Just try to help and it's hard now because how I understand Jesus and how other people who call themselves Christians understand Jesus is not the same. For me, for me the church is being the hands and feet of Jesus. But it isn't for everyone. So if they don't understand that screw them. There's somebody out there. Who, <laughs> there, there are lots of people that don't align this with Jesus that would have that to they know different Jesus, Jesus than I know, and I don't know who Jesus is. Right? Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. Jesus doesn't I'm pay me enough to judge them. Really and I'm moving on and using my inner piece of words. And there is somebody else. else. I honestly right. believe that there is somebody else who can give me those back. Okay. And they have them. Right, right. Okay. And, and I think you have to understand, Sharon and I both are coming out of a religious tradition. Many of our granny volunteers are not. They're coming from a strictly humanitarian perspective, and that's fine. There's no problem with that. We work together well. It's just our language is going to be that because that's where we come from. Um, does not mean that we are saying you're wrong. Although I will say that there are some Christians who are very wrong. But <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was going to say a little bit about volunteer and liability yes. because this is um, considered. I did turn on my yeah. microphone. She's <laughs> asking a question about volunteerism and liability. Well, I have my microphone. Oh, so they think you really good. Use your voice. So, UU Justice Ohio, of course, is a 501c3. We are the fiscal sponsor. We have the liability. We have the responsibility. Um, for those groups that are aligned with us here in Ohio. So that means that they are covered by church mutual insurance mm -hmm. when they are volunteering in designated places, you know, mm -hmm. that we say is a program. Okay, what this means is that no, we don't drive them to a restaurant because we will be taking personal to rely personal responsibility for whatever happens in that car. The San Diego people are noting that human traffickers have been offering rides to restaurants. Mm -hmm. So people are being warned, don't get in the car with anybody, regardless. Yes, what we recommend to our volunteers is you go, get the food, food up, and, and bring, bring it back. back. See, we don't have insurance, which is why we had to build boxes. We, we do now. Insurance. We do yeah. now, but when we started, we didn't. Yeah, just don't do it. We have all the good stuff, right? You know, to protect our volunteers. So another thing too is that if they do make background checks, uh, you know, meet necessary, we got those covered too. We, okay. well, I have one. I, you know, I've been a volunteer forever and worked with, right. you know, refugee stuff. So and being a pastor, I get. Yeah, no, so we have them through church mutual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't cost us. Um, but I also know that the question was, well, why can't we bring food we make from home? Once again, you're taking the responsibility if somebody gets food poisoning, you can and maybe should be sued. Right. Also, the bus station is liable. And the bus station has liability, and then they sue you, Joe, and then our insurance people get mad and you're like, oh, I can't know. Well, and and um, there's, a, there's a whole chain of trying to keep food presentable and at certain temperatures and there are reasons for that and Late we do buses. not want to give people getting on the bus for a long <coughs> trip to new york the runs this is not a good plan so um so we 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 have we bring food from restaurants into the bus station that's fine with our greyhound people um, but they have asked very much that we do not bring food we've made from home. Like we've had people with a 10 hour layover, right? And we will call, we have our unofficial rapid response team. I'll just put a nut up on Facebook that says, okay, we have a mom and three kids that are going to be here for 10 hours. Can somebody bring some food from such and such restaurant out? And they will do that. They will show up and not, you know, immediately somebody will come down with some burritos or, or three ball eggs or something, you know? And, and, and the, the um, other thing that we have part of our, what our GoFundMe account is to pay for is if we did have a family that was going to have an extensive layover, um, we can put them up in a hotel. Um, we have rather than someone's home. 
Right, we have funds for that. And we're prepared, prepared to stay in a room next to them. Yes. If it's a single mom with kids. Yes. So, for safety. you know, um, again, you know, it's, it's, uh, there, there's legal liability issues. Transporting people in your own car becomes problematic. We use Uber. Yes. Because Uber has its own insurance. Now, I do know Uber has been in the news lately, et cetera, et cetera. But use Lyft. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uber or Lyft. I mean, we have gotten to know the cab drivers around the bus station. We know everyone. And Louisville is a small enough city that you, know, you can. Yeah. Um, but, but it's. Uh, some of our policies are definitely to protect the volunteers, others are to protect the asylum seekers, and others are at the- We got pushback. Right I have to tell you, we did get pushback, uh, particularly uh, from folks um, that were, I'm an old grassroots, I'm a community organizer. That was my first job. That was my first training, you know, steal this book, burn this house, burn it down, you know, but, you have to have some protections in place if you want to keep it going. And if when Beth and I started this, we didn't even start it. We just felt like it's totally spirit driven. This is what we have to do. And if, if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, okay. We've at least tried. And and our our theory on sustainability, because we've had some people say, oh, we've got to make a plan for sustainability, is a business plan. Oh, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> that this, it, it, it will happen. If it needs to happen, it will happen. And we will go out and meet the bushes and it will it will happen. And so that's sort of where we are. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and, uh, and I should mention that there's also a question around liability with pictures yes. of children. Because there are predators who watch online where they know that there might be any pictures of children and if they ever associate that with a bus in a particular place or time, then that is not a good thing. We've had this discussion multiple times with churches and church units and youth groups, and the same thing is true. Which is why we take backs and hugs and feet. Right. right. We don't ever do faces. Right. right. Now we do, do we do we do put our pictures of our volunteers on social media. That's and, true. And adults. 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 And our own kids, but with permission. Right. Yeah. And 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 we always try to make you know, that's part of getting the word out is that I will do a post every single Saturday morning after the bus is left. I'm gonna post the pictures of the volunteers, or maybe it's a picture of our table with all the yummy looking fruit and cheese and all of that. And then I'm gonna do a little blurb about what we're doing and how many people we serve because maybe there'll be somebody who sees it who says, oh, that sounds cool, I wanna volunteer. These are, these are some of our people at the bus station. And uh, this was the day that when we handed out stuff, uh, the parents made all the kids, they just pointed to the kids and all the kids lined up and hugged us. It was, that, was a, that was a crying day in the car. And uh, this is the Steal Our Stuff page. These, all of the stuff that we talked about, including this PowerPoint, we have all of our policies um, and more. I just haven't moved them over there yet. We will move them over for you. Um, how we do things. Um, we have a Facebook page. There's a link to it. You can contact us. We didn't have room on the slide to put the Grannies Respond National Facebook page, which is ugly and needs updating. We need a volunteer to look to do that. Anybody know a webmaster person mm -hmm. that will do it for free? I need it for you, Joe. Yeah, it's just, my son does it, but you would think I gave birth to him to do it. <laughs> because he's busy. And, and, we want to be in partnership with you all, and if you would like to use our logo, um, you know, saying in partnership with Granny's Respond, we are perfectly fine with that. We want you to steal our stuff. We want you to use what is appropriate for your situation and make your own for your situation. Um, this is all about, you know, them, them and, and organizing a, a web of groups across the country. It's not about us. 
It's not about the time Sharon and I put into creating the policy. We did it to drive things smooth, to make them go smoothly. And some of our policies you're going to look at and say, what? That ain't us. That's not going to work for us. And here's the thing. I retire, and then a month later I went to the border, and I took one welding class because I was going to be building art. I want to only go to the bus station one day a week, and then I want to build my own. So steal my stuff, set up a lot of bus stations so that I can only go to the bus station one day a week, and make art, and be done with this. But Sharon has been awesome in getting us organized, and hopefully you all will find somebody who's a good organizer in that way, too. Yes, ma'am. And I was going to say, I'm going to send you your stuff. And, and have you give me that copy of that thumb drive today? And then if you email me, then I can share the share Is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And um, if you all have any interest, once you get your logo mm -hmm. in having t shirts, if you uh, want now you may have your own distribution you may not need this but um, you can do your logo on the back and we would do in smaller letters partner with Granny's Respond on the back and get the made up for you and you can have them for ten dollars a pop so if you get the made up for yourself they're going to be about fifteen dollars unless you're ordering major quantities but um, if you're at all interested you just let me know about that um, we. We wear our t-shirts in the summer. Um, sometimes. I can't even get into mine anymore. It's a uh, Trump got elected 40 pound weight gains. Seriously. Mm -hmm. It's problematic. <laughs> sheep caking. Yeah. I've been sheep caking. Bad. And martinis. <laughs> so questions, more questions. Uh, Jennifer Watson from Cincinnati was asking if uh, Marsha, I think it is the supply coordinator you're talking about. Yeah. If uh, if she could be in contact with her, we have the supply coordinator Susan. Um, like, if Marsha's willing to share that information, we she can pick that up. Where's there the will be a sheet. Hmm. Where's the sheet? Mm -hmm. I'm so unorganized about this. Uh, <laughs> Oh. But I think I have your email address. Okay. Uh, email me and ask me for it. Okay. And uh, tell her to email me. Okay. Uh, KYGrannysRespond at gmail.com. And ask for the supplies are email. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm driving right now. Can somebody put that in the chat, the email address? Thank you. Um, when I had gone to the bus station, uh, the family missed the bus, mm -hmm. and they had about a 12 hour wait. They, they were um, a block away from a park. Mm -hmm. And what is the legality of them leaving? Is, are there issues with that? Well, they can leave. If you walked with them, that wouldn't be problematic. If you put them in your car, you now have a problem. Well, okay. and I start, you know, I was telling them about it, and all of a sudden I thought, oh my gosh, would that put them in greater danger? And then luckily it poured down rain, and I did Well, the other it. problem is that you could put them on a different bus if another bus became available. If you tried to get them on a transfer bus, and they missed the opportunity for that. That's there, was, there was not a entry ticket in, and that was our... Or if they got hit by a car, because I think that... Well, yeah, and that's, I mean, that's exactly, well, I was worried about that, I would just. I would never send, I would never send an asylee anywhere outside of the bus station unaccompanied. Because although they've made it across Honduras or Guatemala or wherever, and all the way across Mexico, they're not necessarily going to be street savvy to our city. And they're going to, they possibly could get lost and not find their way back to the bus station. I mean, it's, you know, I, yeah, I, I mean, just. I'm going to walk with them. It's just right. kind of one of those. Well, I've had women coming I'm into the country out. that are totally from rural areas and have never seen a traffic okay. bus. Until they got to the introductions. The paperwork that our people come with, what, what is that? What does that? 
entitle them to, allow them, protect them from? Okay, what it is, is it's their release papers from detention and their papers that designate their sponsor and their papers that tell them when they need to appear in court next, okay? Their release papers from detention are absolutely crucial. Without those, if they were stopped by ICE or Border Patrol or even the police department, they could get docketed as illegal and be deported, okay? So they need those papers. Their papers that show who their sponsor is are equally important uh, because that is also a way of documenting that they're legally here in the United States. There are papers that say when their next court date is very important to them, but wouldn't be necessarily important to officials checking their papers. Would they have to go through a court date back to? Mm -hmm. Not usually. Okay. Usually it's docketed wherever their sponsoring family is. Sometimes that gets messed up, and sometimes they do have to travel back, and that's something that Immigrant Families Together and Racies and some of these other organizations have dealt with. Um, but um, most of the time it's where their sponsors are. We had one instance where there was an asylee on the bus, they got off the bus, didn't come into the bus station because they had to transfer to another bus really quickly, transferred to that bus, that bus left, the bus they had gotten off, off of about half hour later was ready to go, bus driver found their papers. So they're now on a bus illegally. So, and the bus station manager, I said, what are you gonna do with it? And he said, no, we'll take them, we'll take them, <laughs> we'll take them. Well, okay, it's not as easy as it sounds because we did, we, we worked on that. My husband uh, is a fluent Spanish speaker. He grew up in Colombia, South America. And he spent probably four or five hours trying to contact the sponsor because the sponsor isn't gonna pick up a phone call from a phone number he doesn't recognize. So he had to leave voicemails and he had to leave text messages. A lot of these people are extremely wary, okay? So he finally was able to make contact with the sponsor and say, we've got the papers, we're overnighting them. Sharon took care of that part. We're overnighting them to the sponsor. And, but he probably doesn't have your phone number because it's written right here on his sponsor papers that he left on the bus. So he may not be able to call you when he gets to the bus station. So my husband helped him figure out when theoretically the bus would be coming in and said, you'll have to go to the bus station and wait and just wait and hope he gets off the bus. And, but it all, it all turned out well. So, yes. An economic nerd question. What is your annual budget now? We don't know. Okay. <laughs> we, we're working on it. We're working on it. Uh, we raised about, our balance today was $8,100. Okay. We figured out by the end of this year, we'll have served 12,000 people. Okay. Most of the snacks that we have provided and most of the meals that we have provided, food that we have provided, hygiene kits and everything, have been donated. Yeah. I'm gonna crunch the numbers soon and figure it out. I haven't really done um, financial reports. All I do is Beth and I are on the account for accountability, right. and uh, I don't do a financial report even though I could, I refuse to. I want to find an account to do it for us for free because I'm busy. <laughs> so, you know, I, I just go in and I look and see how many times we went to Amazon and know that there are supplies, that, that we bought supplies. I keep receipts, of course, when we, the only administrative expenditures we have are we bought carts, and everything else has been an expenditure that went up. Finally, I spent 200 bucks on office supplies because I was spending money on copies, postage, and everything out of pocket. But because we, we are kind of flush with money now. I'm just, I'm just asking that because we are setting up a separate line of account. Sure. Right. Um, and and want to make sure that. And, and like I said, Beth and I probably spent two grand out of pocket up front. Yeah. And when I start writing grants, which I do do. Yes. I know. Really? I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I had done it too, sister. I just refuse to do it. I hear you. Um, yeah. So. The key to our success so far has been the supply chain 
with the snack kits and the hygiene kits. And that has meant that Sharon and I have gone out, drunk up, and pushes and back alleys and talk to them or listen. So we can all the time we go on and do this. And we can take our dog on the show and ask for um we ask for snack kits that they complete that they that they make that they have an event and all that things to that and then and then every time that we also get financial donations. And today for example I always post something Love over for my preacher days that says Happy Sabbath. Today, we're, I realized in about two months we'll have served 12,000 people. We're going to Columbus to meet new friends and tell them what we've been doing. And how much money do we raise on the bill of money? over $230. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's how it works. That's how it works. <laughs> okay. And um, it's for us, we try to reserve the GoFundMe for emergency type expenditures or administrative type expenditures. We'll get that just out of the third bus line. Yes, it is. It's all for the percentage of five. But, but we really try to not spend money on purchasing what we can get done. Good. Okay. Um, could p.m. bus, which is great because that's how it, that's how it happens. But um, you know, we might be for 40 a.m. bus. <laughs> I don't know what your bus station is, but some bus stations are in parts of town that aren't the junkie, the meth, that's the prostitution people, the sad people. I've never been afraid. Some of our people are. And we do practice security. Like I wear a fanny pack now, and I'm proud of it. Yes, I don't she doesn't take anything. I, I don't take anything that won't fit in my pocket. <laughs> and we have never had an issue. Although, I've been there all hours of the day. Although we did have an issue the other day, and this is something we're gonna have to go over in volunteer training. One of our one of our volunteers pulled out some cash to make change for a 20 so that the person could use the uh, Oh yeah, I wasn't there for that. The um, vending machine, and all of a sudden, all the homeless people, all they like, they, they want money, okay? And apparently, one person got really offensive about it, um, the way people with mental health issues can sometimes be. Um, so, you know, there there are things you can do to protect yourself so that you're not presenting as a as a target. And um, but as Sharon said, I. I don't feel uncomfortable. I, I don't feel uncomfortable with the bus station. I mean, it may be because I run a shelter for homeless people, but, but at the same time, yeah, you know, uh, um, it, it's, uh, you know, it's wise about it. I think the way where I was going is we have not been able, we have not had tons of people coming forward who have wanted to go down to the bus station after about 5 p.m. Yes. So, and, and so that's, yeah, Day, daytime hours we're pretty good with, and during the summer, the idea of a 9.35 p.m. bus doesn't seem that bad, but in February, it might just not, might lose its appeal. Yeah. And for the, the logistics of the training you guys do, the one Saturday morning mm -hmm. month, 
Is that something that you have to limit to a certain amount of volunteers because of the bus station limitations? Yeah, we tell them. them. We, we just tell them. Saturday, we're going to have more people. And he together. comes over and says hello to our people. Okay. One thing we, we're going to try to remember to do, because even though we have a table, it's standing, and it takes about 40 minutes, and then if the bus is on time, they get to watch the bus. Oh. So the whole thing takes about an hour, and it's really hard to find floors. And most of our people, our main challenge right now is most of our people are retired, and they can't pull the load that some of our younger people could possibly, and then our younger people are gone when the semester ends. <laughs> so we're trying to find, with 138 volunteers, you think that we could fill at least three slots every single day of the week. We can't always. Sometimes well, we only have two. In June right now, we have- Everybody's on vacation. Everybody's on vacation, that, so we're really- So I'm gonna have to cool. close days which always breaks my heart. Yes. Another question that was raised by the folk in San Diego, they say that they have had some instances of folks signing up and volunteering just so they could get access to a vulnerable, a vulnerable uh, uh, asylum-seeking person. Have you ever had that kind of an issue? Well, we, we work only in teams. And um, as I said, our bus station isn't very big. Right. You would have to work really, really hard to disappear off of my line of vision with someone. We don't have extensive periods of time to work with the um, asylees. So no, we have not encountered that issue. But one of the reasons that we have them sign the agreement is that if we ever had any sort of issues, we could say to them, you signed this agreement, you've broken this agreement, you can no longer be a volunteer. So it's very cut and dry. The one thing that we're doing in Columbus is, uh, with Warren and I looking at the, the Facebook group, is we have screening questions. So anyone that is coming to the group, we have our main land page where anyone can invite friends to, et cetera. And that is where you learn about what we do and who we are. And we're screening people. It is incredibly easy to screen people. Um, you can check out a fake profile very quickly. We have none of that. Um, but then if you want to, if you've shown that you're engaged and that you are actually going and willing to go, then we have an even more closed Facebook group that's for depot volunteers only. And you can only get to, and that's where all the specifics with bus routes are. So you can't get bus route information unless you've basically been cleared by us twice. So I definitely agree that's a huge thing to keep in mind, but I do think at least we put in some roadblocks. To to you can tweak it to, to meet your requirements. Like we are described on mostly know everybody. And anybody that comes to our Facebook page, they seem to know somebody who's already on this profile. But we don't let them on the AM bus leads. And yeah, we don't let them on the page until they've been to a training and they've given us their, their information. They do they, not they get the come, link. They come to the Kentucky Action page, which is our main, just like you, our main landing page. But to get to the actual organization of the bus station page, they have to have a hard training, sign volunteer agreement, and, you know, what? Sharon and I, I eyes on the spoken, et cetera. Um, most of our trainings are between 12 and 15. Here's something that I did not talk much about, and you guys will have to confront this and figure it out. It's about press coverage. When the press finds out that we were, everyone thought that we were so freaking cute because we were a bunch of little old grannies, and they wanted to follow us all over the country, particularly when this caravan started. And uh, no. We don't want you to come and shoot pictures of us feeding little sweet asylum kids and sweet grannies. No, you can't do it. Yeah, uh, policies, no media. Good. But you want, it's a, it's a, you know, like the New York Times, we finally agreed, is going to cover some of the buses, but only some of us will talk to them outside of the bus station. And, and tell some stories. And Greyhound won't usually let videographers into the bus station. Right. We had to get 
extra special human rights watch came human and rights watch us, came and which is a valid right they but they had to get they had to get permission from corporate greyhound and the corporate said no by the way oh but they came anyway yeah because granny said they could and we said okay. they could <laughs> <laughs> but anyway but they were very careful the, per the videographer was very familiar with what would be appropriate types of videos to shoot and and all of that and, and they shot most of it outside of greyhound yeah. in my house yeah, interviewing in, my beth, house. in yeah. beth's house yeah. in our church yeah they saw the the snack kit preparation and all of that mm -hmm. um so so yeah and they did a uh, another group did something on the grannies in sacramento and again they showed the snack kit preparation and talked to the grannies and they showed the grannies going into the Greyhound station, but they didn't do any videography in the Greyhound station. And the reason we decided to do that was because it lifted up this situation and it talked about the justice pieces, mm -hmm. the important justice pieces. And you have to make sure that you have people, if you're going to talk to the press, who will talk about the justice piece. And yeah, it's, it's an opportunity to reiterate. It is. Are I mean, have trained people, <laughs> people right. who have the talking points that are important. And mm -hmm. and it's, but it, we're very very cautious about any press request, and we vet it through national. And yeah, we have a press coordinator coordinator at national that everything is run through, and so that we don't have to make the decision. And but, and then it's final. The final decision is left to each group, each yeah. grand group. And some of the grannies groups say absolutely not. No, 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 won't do any press for anybody, regardless. That's New Orleans. No, won't do any press. Uh, Sacramento feels less. Team Brownsville, they don't care. Team Brownsville does. They, they want, they want the press. So, um, yeah. All right, we're just about out of time here. So, any last? Questions for you. Sharon and I are, are available. You can email us. You can get hold of us on Facebook. Um, and, uh, you know, we're happy to answer questions, give you, you know, what if, you know, we'll give you our opinion uh, for what this worth, that 25 cents. We have a page in that file called Problem Solving 101. <laughs> no, isn't that what we call Problem Solving 101 that we give leads? What happens if... Right. <laughs> Right. Which all of they were situations we encountered. Beautiful. Absolutely. I want to thank you both. This has been absolutely great having you. All of you. We are thrilled. We are thrilled. We were, we were For 10 months, we've been thinking, we're the end of the line. Where are the rest of our people up there? We know you're there. Where are you? And I'm going to tell the people online that we recorded this so that we can send this out to you and the PowerPoint out to you if you email me, because I don't want to do just a blanket on this. And it's uujoanvanb at gmail. Uh, that's the easy one. It's, and it's the one that you all keep getting anyway every time I send out an email. So thank you. All righty. It'll be six, six, seven. I mean, I, I work.